All right, so here in this video, we're going to be looking at the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is just a fancy word for the shoulder joint and all that that entails. And it consists primarily of the clavicle and the scapula. And so we'll look at these two bones and some of their associated muscles and whatnot. Talk about those things, not look at them in particular. But the clavicle joins, let's look particularly, we can see it here in this picture. The clavicle joins to the sternum, which is right here, medially, and distally joins to the scapula. The scapula only have one point of articulation, and that is here. You can see the scapula back there in the background it has only one point of articulation, and they attach to the back via muscles only. The pectoral girdle attaches to the upper arms, or it attaches the upper arm, sorry, to the axial skeleton. So this is what attaches our arms to everything else on us and provides attachment points for the muscles for those up for the upper arm to limb or for the upper limb to move. Their light frame allows the limbs it's this unique kind of mobility. If you think about your arms and the, the range that you're able to move them over your head, in front of you, behind you, whatnot, compared to the rest of the body, this is different for sure. This is only because the clavicle attaches to your axial skeleton and gives it that bracing. And the shoulder joint is actually pretty shallow and poorly reinforced. So this gives you lots of mobility. It's bad for stability purposes, which we'll look at a couple of that injuries in a moment, but it's really good for mobility. And so we've traded mobility for, uh, or we've traded stability for more mobility. So looking at specifically at the clavicles, the word clavicle means little keys. These are slender S shaped bones. They support lots of muscles on your chest and neck. They act as braces to kind of hold your arms out. If you've ever broken your clavicle, you probably know what this means. Your shoulder would actually collapse toward your chest without your clap without your clavicle. And so if you've ever broken that, you probably feel that pressure. Uh, they also the clavicles also transmit compression forces from the upper arms to the axial skeleton. So like when you push forward with your hands, it transmits a lot of that pressure into the back and into the chest and some some of the other areas taking a lot of the pressure off your arms uh, they're not a very strong bone though and they break easily like if you're trying to break a fall particularly if your arms are outstretched when you're falling and you try to break that fall you can easily break your clavicle people who do a lot of manual labor or who are involved in athletics that involve a lot of the upper body typically have much stronger, larger clavicles than those who don't. Remember, we talked about bone remodeling, remodeling. And so the clavicle can change quite a bit based on these kinds of pressures that are put on it. So looking at the scapula, uh, these are typically known as the shoulder blades, what we call them. They're thin triangular bones, but they've got these weird ridges and things sticking out of them. The name is actually comes from the from a word na uh, for shovel in ancient cultures because ancient cultures would take a scapula of animals and use them as shovels, and so the name kind of stuck. This is located on the dorsal surface of the ribs, so behind the ribs, between ribs two and seven, and laterally, the scapula ends at this place called the glenoid cavity. And this glenoid cavity is what articulates with the humerus of your upper arm, kind of forming your shoulder. It's not a very deep socket. The posterior surface has this large spine, which you can see here, that you can easily feel. If you feel back there on your shoulder blades, you can kind of feel that, that spine. And it ends in this thing called the acromion, which articulates with the clavicle, forms that acromioclavicular joint. Let's see if I have a picture. I don't. I have a broken scapula picture. But you can see the acromio end right here, that acromioclavicular joint. There it is. You can see that there. This is the acromion. This is the clavicle. So they make that, that joint. And the coracoid process, which is this little knob right here that sticks out, 
see it here as well. This is what anchors the bicep muscle. So your bicep will attach up there. If you've ever had a torn bicep or a strained bicep, that is probably where you feel it. And uh, there's several large fossa. We talked about these fossa, these dips in here. And their purpose is to allow muscle attachments and different things underneath and on top of the shoulder blade. So there's a lot going on in the shoulder blade. A couple of common injuries. Uh, broken clavicle, of course. We mentioned that. And this is a picture of a broken clavicle. That one looks like it's been wrecked pretty good. And so maybe a fall or some sort of uh, injury in that way. A lot of times in collision sports, uh, people will oftentimes get these broken clavicles because trying to catch themselves or brace themselves against someone else. The joints, and this is another one here, the separated shoulder. This is that acromioclavicular joint. And if the ligaments here basically will just strain and it can take up to six weeks to heal just on its own and sometimes require surgery for that. But this is what is known as a separated shoulder. This is different than a dislocated shoulder. And you can see here, this is that glenoid cavity. And this is the humerus. And it should be up here, but it's not. And um, so you can see it makes this little thing right here. This is a telltale sign of someone's shoulder being separated that the this bone kind of sticks out weirdly. Um and again, this has to do with just pressure being put on that cavity. It's not a very strong joint, and so just a little bit of pressure can knock it out. And usually once you've had your shoulder dislocated, it's really easy to do that a second time.